Good evening at 7 p.m. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening giving you all the glory and the honor and the praise that is due your name. You alone are God, and beside you there is no other. We thank you for this day that you have made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. We thank you, Father, for every good gift uh, which comes only from you, most especially your son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have redemption and the gift of your Holy Spirit, through whom we are empowered to be witnesses for you. We thank you, Father, for another opportunity to assemble in the house of prayer. We thank you for those who are assembled virtually, and we have come for no other purpose but than to study your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And so, Father, as we come tonight gathered around your word, we pray that you would help us uh, in our learning tonight. First, we ask that you would uh, help us to be free of any thoughts, cares, and anxieties that would keep us from focusing uh, on illumination by the power of your Holy Spirit from your word tonight. Uh, Lord, we have been in different places and spaces, mentally, physically, and spiritually since Sunday. And uh, in, in our traversing, we have perhaps we have picked up some of the world's junk. We ask that you would uh, set us free from it and clear our minds, Father, clear our hearts, God, so that we might come before you as empty vessels before a full fountain, that you would fill us to overflowing with the knowledge of your word, that we might take your word in, and in all our getting, we would have an understanding. We also need a teacher tonight, and so we pray that you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit and help us to see what you would have us to see in this word, that we would be more effective witnesses for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we love you tonight and we praise your holy name and we thank you for it in advance for having your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one, none else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one, no, not one, for Jesus knows all about our troubles and he will die till the day is done there's not a friend like the lowly jesus no not one no not one no friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one, for Jesus knows all about our troubles, and he will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one, there is none like you, no one else can touch our hearts like you do. I can search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. Help me to sing that one more time. There is none like you. There is none like you. 
No one else can touch our hearts like you do. No one else can touch our hearts like you do. I can search for all eternity, Lord. I can search for all eternity, Lord, and still find, and still find there is none, there is none, there is none, there is none, there is none like you. Clap your hands like there's nobody like Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nobody like him. Nobody like him. He's a mighty God. He's a holy God. He's a worthy God. And there's no failure in him. Have you tried him tonight? Isn't he a good God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy, we know it's hump day, but if you have joy in Jesus, you can get some strength. Amen. 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 So tonight, this will conclude, at least in this series and season and setting, our last um, Bible study on stewardship because uh, next week is Thanksgiving Eve. And so I know you're going to be just cutting collards, chopping collars and and cleaning turkeys and, and whatnot and peeling sweet potatoes and getting ready to have it going on for the next day. So I will say that there will be uh, a Thanksgiving worship service aired on Thanksgiving Day at 11 a.m. And then the following week, we're moving Workers' Council to November 29th because that would also be on Thanksgiving Eve. And so we're going to take the holiday and then we're going to have Workers' Council on the 29th. So the next Bible study that we have that first week in December, we will be in Advent. So we'll be uh, focusing on Christ in coming of Christ. All right. And so tonight, I want to talk about uh, giving as an act of worship. I say I want to talk about, that's what I was led to talk about, giving as an act of worship. Because I've been saying that to you all October, all November, that giving is an act of worship. But I want to give a Bible study to explicate that. And every time you come to worship and all the things that you do to worship God, I want you to see giving as a part of that also. All right. So what is worship? I want to give you this definition for worship. Worship consists of the ways we feel and express reverence and adoration of God. It consists of all the ways we feel and express reverence and adoration of God. And so what are some of the primary ways that we worship God when we come for corporate worship, when we come together as brothers and sisters, uh, redeemed saints and redeemed sinners <laughs> uh, to worship God? Well, one of the most obvious things that we connote with worship is singing, right? Even praise and worship, that's singing. So we sing to worship. Psalm 97, 1 and 2 says, oh, sing to the Lord of new songs, sing to the Lord, all the earth, sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. So we sing to God uh, as an act of reverence and adoration um, for some dance, like liturgical dance, and then some, uh, you know, dance uh, spontaneously in the spirit. Uh, that is an act of worship. Psalm 149 and 3, let them praise him, praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and the harp. So we have singing, dancing. Then we have words of adoration, things that we say to God. God, I praise you. I worship you. I glorify your name, right? Words of adoration. And Hebrews 13 and 15 says, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips. That's our words, giving thanks to his name. So we use our words to worship God. And then one of the one of the most important ways that we don't talk about how we must worship God is through obedience, right? And holy living. Romans 12 and one says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now that word service, your reasonable service and the Greek is latria, which means worship. All right. So uh, 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 in other words, a basic component of our worship is presenting our bodies as a sacrifice to God, being obedient, living according to his word. And then tonight, giving, we're going to talk about giving. 
Proverbs 3 and 9 says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of your increase. And so we worship God through giving. So what's so worshipful about giving? I think it's obvious to see the singing is worship and the words is worship and the dance is worship. But what's worshipful about giving? So there are components to giving um, that are cardinal to worship. So to give requires faith. To give requires faith. Um, as hard as money is to come by, especially in, in this uh, inflation, you have to give to something that you believe, right? Uh, someone said uh, on their Christmas list, instead of jewelry this year, they wanted groceries <laughs> because things have gotten so high, right? But <laughs> they said they wanted groceries and they wanted a light bill paid and all that. Um, but and so it it takes faith. We give because we believe we're not giving out of a show, especially when you tithe, when you give to 10 percent of your income and increase is because you believe in the God to whom you're giving. There's also and so that takes worship. Worship is grounded in faith. We're going to talk about that tonight. we got to believe God is in order to worship him, but also love and adoration. There's an element of love there in giving. Right. When you are when you love, you give. You give to your children, you give to your parents, you give to uh, your, your significant person, right? Um, and so as we give to God and to the ministry of Jesus Christ uh, in the church, we're giving out of a love to God. Then there's liturgy, L-I-T-U-R-G-Y, liturgy. There's an element of liturgy to giving. What is, what is liturgy? Liturgy simply means ritual performance, and everything we do in worship is liturgy, whether you realize it or not, and no matter how informal it is, because usually when we think of liturgy and worship, we think of we think of like um, a, a, a Catholic kind of marching into the service and bells and whistles. But everything you do when you come into the church and you say, hey, how are you? Oh, God bless you. Good to see you. I haven't seen you since last week. That's a part of you coming into God's house. That's a part of you fellowshipping. And then when we sit down. And then we go through our program. Uh, if you've been in church for a while, and particularly in this church, you don't know, you don't know one has to tell you when to stand up. Sometimes you'll see me do this, but for the most part, people are already standing up because we have our rituals. Do you see? We know when to sit down, we know when to bow our head. Even little Luke knows to put his hand, we're getting ready to pray, he'll put his hands together. All of that is ritual, right? And so as we give to God, there's an element of ritual, particularly before COVID, you would see the ushers get in formation and then people would uh, bring out their gifts to give. One of the things that I really loved about giving is coming to the altar, right? I used to love that marching around, not so much for the pageantry of marching around and seeing people, but I felt like I was taking my gifts and bringing it to the table of sacrifice, right? And so I've shared that with you. So one of the ways that I create ritual around giving now is when I see that my direct deposit has hit, I try before I even get a cup of coffee to make sure I give that first. That's my ritual, right? And so we give even in liturgy. Most of us have a liturgy of how we give, all right? Even in this post-COVID era. And then sacrifice, which is self-explanatory. I mean, uh, you get no more of a worshipful activity than sacrifice. From the beginning of time, the way that people connected to God was through sacrifice. They would bring the animal, right, to sacrifice. And so even now, when we bring our gifts, um, there's an element of sacrifice. Or there should be. Sometimes it's a tip. We're going to talk about that. But there should be an element of sacrifice. So in giving, there's faith, there's love, there's liturgy, and there's sacrifice. And so to learn more about giving as an act of worship, tonight we're going to study the woman, <coughs> excuse me, the woman who anointed Jesus with expensive oil, expensive fragrant oil for his burial. This woman is recorded in all four Gospels. She's uh, this event of her anointing Jesus with the expensive fragrant oil is recorded in Matthew 26, 6 through 13. It's in Mark 14, 3 through 9. It's in Luke chapter 7, 36 through 50 and John 12, 1 through 8. There are not a whole lot of events that are recorded in all four Gospels. Very often there's commonality in Matthew, Mark and Luke. These are called the synoptic gospels because there's so many things in common. But this event is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as well as John. 
Now, I want to say something about that. Um, we're going to read three of these four versions. We're going to look at three of them tonight. And uh, uh, and looking at them, what I noticed that was that some of the details are a little different. For example, um, wh whose house Jesus was in when the woman anointed him with oil varies in the Gospels. Some say that he was in, John says he was in Lazarus's house, Mary and, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's house. Some say that he was in a Pharisee's house. Uh, one says that he's in Simon the leper's house. So you see those kind of varying details, right? But what they all will say was that this woman came, had very expensive oil, and anointed Jesus' head. Now, why am I saying this? To me, when you see these in the gospel, some people will make the argument that the varying descriptions poke holes in the validity of the gospel. It is quite the opposite. It lends full authenticity to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you why. If there were an, if there was an accident on the corner of uh, Lincoln and North Corners Lane, if you got four people's version of it, all of them are going to tell you something different. They're going to have different details. They're going to see different colors. But what a good detective will parse out is that all of them will tell you who hit who first, who didn't signal, and, 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 and who got out the car threatening someone, right? All of that will be the same. The major events will be the same. And so the fact that we have these minor details that are different lends credence to the fact that these are real human beings reporting their perspectives. And the fact that they all co all agree on the fact that first for tonight, this woman anointed Jesus head with oil means that we have authenticity that this happened. But more importantly, they all agree that on Friday he died <laughs> and that on Sunday he rose for our sins, all right? And so that's what I love about the Gospels. We see clearly that Jesus Christ is Lord. So tonight we're going to look at uh, Luke's version, then uh, Mark's version, and then John's version. Whenever I preach from Luke, my baby gets so excited. He thinks I'm calling him to come up to the pulpit. And so uh, yesterday with Sister uh, Pastor Hickman, she she came from Luke, and he just knew that uh, she needed his help. All right. Luke chapter seven. We're going to start at verse 36. When you have it, say amen. Luke chapter seven, verse 36. All right, let's go through it. Uh, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There uh, was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, and the other owed 50. And when he had nothing with which to repay, he freely when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet from the time I came in. You did not anoint my feet with my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, 
who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith have saved you. Go in peace. All right. So let's go to verse 36. Um, are you back at the top with me? Say amen. All right. So then uh, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Now, if that had been me, I would have kind of gave this a side eye if the Pharisee had invited me to eat because the Pharisees had a toxic relationship with Jesus. They usually only engage him in an attempt to set him up or to catch him saying or doing something that they could use against him to have him put away. But in spite of this, Jesus seems to immediately accept the invitation to dinner in this Pharisee's home because that's just how Jesus is. No matter how bad we are, Jesus will accept our invitation and come into our lives. That's a note that we need to catch. No matter how bad we are, Jesus will accept our invitation and come into our lives. No matter how bad we are, Jesus will accept our invitation and come into our lives. Let's go to verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Now let's talk about this woman. Sis is not given a name. She's just called a sinner, all right? Um, this is interesting because uh, all of us could be called a sinner, right? And the Pharisee was a sinner. Uh, th that's the newsflash. The, Phar the Pharisee who invited him was a sinner. But the, the difference is this. This woman is labeled a sinner because it is obvious that her sin was public. But the Pharisee was just as much a sinner, but he was a sinner in private. But both the public sinner and a private sinner is still the sinner. And the public sinner and the private sinner both need to sit at that table with Jesus, right? <laughs> and let's catch that note. Both the public sinner and the private sinner needs Jesus. Both the public. And that is why, you know, um, in Galatians chapter 6, it, it tells us to be careful of judging people unless we fall into the same judgment. Very often when people fall publicly, um, it, it, uh, there are those who are within the church who have fallen privately, who will look down on them or who will be reluctant to bring them in. But you see here, Jesus sits with the public center and the private center. Uh, because our sins are private, that much the more we ought to embrace those who are in public. One day you may be in public. Let the church say amen. Mighty quiet in the Bible study. All right. <laughs> but both the public center and the private center, we all need Jesus. Amen. All right, let's look at verse 37 again. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, alabaster flask of fragrant oil, verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears. I mean, she's really crying and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. So this woman, who is a public sinner, worships Jesus. She bows down to him, and she emotes. She's crying. She's worshiping from her heart. She then gives very expensive oil to him and uses it to anoint him. No one in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, worship Jesus as dramatically as this woman does without asking for anything, right? You have people who will call out to him saying, come heal me, come heal my daughter, come heal my child. But Jesus does not ask for, I mean, this woman does not ask Jesus for anything. She's just there worshiping him. Why? Because in spite of her sins, she seems to have a knowledge of who he is. She's the only one in this house doing the right thing because she has an inclination that, no, this is more than a prophet. This is more than a miracle worker. This is someone I need to bow down to. This is someone I need to pour out my sacrifice of expensive oil on. So she has a knowledge of God. And although she's a sinner, she through that knowledge of God, she becomes a worshiper. All right. So knowledge of God transitions us from sinner to worshiper. 
Catch that note. Knowledge of God transitions us from sinner to worshiper. The more we know about God, the more we become a worshiper, which is why when we say come as we come as you are, that's not about an outfit. We need to encourage people to come on into the church and come on to Christ just as they are. Because even though they come in a public center, the more they learn about Jesus, Jesus will transform them into worshipers. All right. Uh, you know, the say you can't you cannot clean a fish until you catch it. Let people come in just as they are. I'll never forget uh, 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 one of my uh, cousins was having a deep debate uh, because there was this woman who came in very scantily clad, like almost naked to church. And people were going back and forth about whether or not that should happen. And I just listened to it. They didn't engage me on it. So I was just listening to it. And said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So finally they said, Brian, you a pastor. What do you think? And I said, if this is all this sister had, let her come into the church because any change that needs to take place will happen through the preaching of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. All right. So when that woman, the public center, when she got in that room where Jesus was and having some knowledge of who he was, she becomes a worshiper in a way that's going to change her by the time she leaves. All right. So knowledge of God transitions us from center to worshiper. But let's talk about this situation, because, you know, I've, I've read this text and studied this woman before in preaching and teaching. And I left this time in preparing for this Bible study. I left with some questions that I've never had before. Can we look at verse 39 again? Or did we look at 39 yet? Let's look at verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who invited Jesus saw this, when he saw the woman worshiping him and pouring the oil and crying and wiping his feet with her tears in her hair, he spoke to him himself. He didn't say this out loud, spoke to himself. This man, if he were the real deal, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner a woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. I have questions. Question number one, how did this Pharisee know what manner of woman this was? Isn't he a man of prayer? A man in the temple? How did he know her? Number two, why didn't he say anything to stop her entry if she was an undesired guest? Let me tell you something. If I'm throwing a dinner party and somebody comes in off the street, <laughs> the street with the K that I didn't invite it, I'm going to stop them in the hallway, if not at the door. It's almost as if she, come, she came in and he, he wasn't over surprised, right? Then number three, why did the woman feel so at ease coming to his house? Verse 37, it says she found out whose house it was. She said, bet, I'm on the way. She didn't say, oh my goodness, I can't go to the Pharisee's house. She was very comfortable, came in, made herself known, right? Now, I'm saying all this to say that we have to, we have to ask these questions and be open and be fair to everyone uh, 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 that we're studying in the scripture. A very traditional patriarchal look at this text will condemn this woman when the reality of the matter is, it seems that everybody in here knew who she was right? Without question. Very often in these kinds of situations, women will be condemned and not the patron when the women cannot be in the position they were without patrons. I mean, even look at the newspaper, you'll see the women in their picture, not one picture or name of the patron. Do you understand where I'm going? All right. But this Pharisee seemed to know who this woman was and uh, this woman seemed very comfortable in his house. So the text does not explicitly say this, but it is very possible that she was formally acquainted with the Pharisee. But even if she was, so what? It is clear from her act of worship that she's there for one reason, and that is to see and to be with Jesus. She does not care that other people at the dinner party might have known that she was a public sinner. All she wants to do is get into the house where Jesus is. Let me tell you something. Do not let others' awareness of your mistakes keep you from church, keep you from Jesus. If, if you know Jesus is there with your mistakes, with your history, with your past and all, go see Jesus. Have the attitude of Jesus is there, so am I. So let's catch this note. Do not let others' awareness of your mistakes keep you from church or from Jesus, even better. Do not let others' awareness of your mistakes keep you from church or keep you from Jesus.
We have that. Let's go to verse 40. Now, Jesus teaches, teaches a powerful leadership lesson right here. Verse 40, it says, and Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. And so then Jesus is about to go into the parable of the denarii. What is powerful about what happens here is that Jesus knows what the Pharisee is thinking. And he knows that the Pharisee has just said to himself, uh, Jesus ain't real. This uh, he's not. He couldn't even be a prophet because he would know what kind of woman this is. Now, Jesus knows that this man has just insulted him in his mind. And as a result, he kind of has cause to retaliate. But instead of retaliating, he turns this situation into a teachable moment. Very often when you are in leadership, there will be those in your fellowship who will cast aspersions or say something that in your flesh you may want to retaliate, right? But if you lead it to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will empower you to turn it into a teachable moment so that they can learn from that moment. And so that's what Jesus does. He doesn't condemn him and say, what do you mean if I was real? Let me tell you what I know about you. Jesus doesn't retaliate. He says, let me give you this lesson, all right? And so uh, 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 in moments of retaliation, uh, we need to create teaching moments, uh, teachable moments, all right? Uh, so uh, let me give you this note. Turn moments of retaliation into teachable moments. Turn moments of retaliation into teachable moments. And you can put there, like Jesus, <laughs> like Jesus. If we can mortify that flesh enough and turn, lean into the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will give us something to teach in that moment. Is that clear to everyone? All right. Verse 41. So then Jesus goes into his parable, uh, 41 through 47. Therefore, a certain creditor who had two debtors, uh, uh, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when he had, uh, and when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Therefore, he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased, ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you by her sin, say to you her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So Jesus reveals through the parable of the denarii that the passion behind this woman's worship is that she loved God in a way that matched the depths of her sins. She loved God in a way that matched the depths of our sins. So that, uh, she, so all that she did to and for Jesus was out of gratefulness for his capacity to forgive. Let me say this. Uh, we should not wallow in our past, uh, our past mistakes and our past sins, but we should always be aware of what the Lord has forgiven us of and where he has brought us from. Uh, that will keep us humble that will help us as we minister to others, but it will also keep us grateful for what the Lord has done. Uh, when we realize that what we have done, that that we too uh, crucified him afresh through our sins, and that will keep us grateful. Our worship and devotion to God then should match our awareness of our sins and the redeeming power of Jesus Christ, all right? And you can catch that note if you want, that our worship and devotion to God should match our awareness of our sins, our awareness of our sins and the redeeming power of Christ. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Boom. She came in. She worshiped God. She worshiped Christ. She sacrificed. And as a result of her worship and as a result of her faith, her sins were forgiven. Worship of God undergirded by faith in God will bring restoration. 
Verse 49, and those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so we see right here why the rest of those at the dinner party cannot worship Jesus like this woman can. They don't know who Jesus is. Who is this? First, if this man were a prophet, this man is the one who speaks to the prophet to give them the, the knowledge, right? And then uh, uh, who is this who even forgives sins? They have no idea who Jesus is. And if you don't know who Jesus is, you cannot truly worship him. All right. Catch this final note uh, on this before we move on. Worship is grounded in our faith and knowledge of God. Worship is grounded in our faith and knowledge of God. We've got to know who he is and believe who he is as the at the very start of being able to feel and express reverence and, ad and adoration, which was our, our definition for worship. So in this woman, we see elements of worship through giving. Um, but let's just talk about the elements through worship. We'll come back to the giving piece. Where do we see worship here? Well, she had the faith. She had the faith. She, she heard that Jesus was in the Pharisee's house. She made the bold move to go in there. She wasn't worried about anybody trying to stop her or block her, what they had to say about her. She didn't ask permission. She went straight to Jesus and she began to worship him. That took faith and belief that he was someone worthy of worship. And then we see love. She emoted through tears to the extent that Jesus described her tears as washing his feet. Then we even see liturgy. We see worship. She comes to him. She bows down. And then she uses her hair to wipe his tears. And so she's going through the ritual, through a movement of worship. And then uh, she sacrifices. She takes this expensive bottle of oil and she pours it all on Jesus. Now, if she is in a desperate vocation, as the scripture intimates, this very expensive box of oil may have costed her all that she had. All right. So she gave a true sacrifice in order to honor Christ. All right. And this will then and, and in all of this, she's giving as well. But I want to pull in Mark and I pull and pull in John and then we'll talk about that at the end. So let's go to the gospel of Mark, chapter 14, Mark, chapter 14. We're just looking at verses three two, through nine. You should know that New Testament scholars assert that Mark is actually the oldest gospel. Matthew is first. Uh, in secession in the New Testament, but Mark is the oldest gospel and Mark is the template. So just about every passage you'll see in Mark, you will also see in Matthew and you'll see in Luke. But Matthew, uh, being a tax collector, um, has his emphasis. And then Luke, being a physician, has his emphasis. You'll see a lot of healing in Luke, right? And then... <laughs> I don't want to call John a narcissist, but John being Jesus' best friend, you're going to see a lot of John saying the disciple whom Jesus loved and John's perspective, right? Um, but but Mark is the template. So let's look at Mark chapter 14. We want to look at verses three through nine. When you have it, say amen. Mark chapter three, and it reads, um, and, G and being at Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask a very costly oil of spikenard. And she broke the flask and poured it on his head. I want to stop in this gospel to focus on just how expensive this offering was. And I want you to note that the oil was expensive. It was fragrant, which means that it went through a process. To make fragrant oil in ancient times, you, you, you had to take flowers, you had to take weeds, uh, herbs that would create a certain scent and go through this process. And so to have fragrant oil was expensive, but then it wasn't just contained in a clay pot. It was in an alabaster flask. So both the oil was expensive and the vessel was expensive, but she took the expensive flask and broke it. And she took the oil and poured it on Jesus in an offering of worship. And so what we see is that this woman is really giving something that costs. And so the takeaway here is that worshiping God through giving always costs the giver something. If we go back to one of our very first Bible lessons, we talked about Cain and Abel. Uh, uh, Abel gave his very best 
of his flock, right? And if you look at all of the sacrifices in the Old Testament, there's usually some livestock that has to die. Uh, and so all of that costs. And so again, it is sacrifice that makes giving a key element in worship. If you're giving, you know, uh, a, a little bit of this and you're not really feeling it, you have to give something that you can feel. If you're not feeling it, if it's not a sacrifice, then it's probably not worship. Anytime we tithe, I don't know anybody who can't use that 10%. That is something you can feel. That 10% can go in other places in our fleshly mind, right? But out of our love to God and our carnal mind, but out of our love to God, our faith in God, we sacrifice. We give something that we feel, all right? Catch this note. Giving to God should cost us something. Giving to God should cost us something. We should feel it when we give, put it that way. We should feel it when we give. Otherwise, it's a tip. I don't miss a tip. Now, some of these restaurants where they charge a gratuity, sometimes you feel that because <laughs> they decide what the percentage is going to be, right? But but uh, very often we tip God. We just give something here or there. I can't leave uh, uh, the house now headed to the church, Sister Wiggins, without Desi and Ruby asking for coins to go into the jar, Right. And I just say, here, take a bunch of coins because it's great. It's it's a sacrifice to them. They can hold on to it in their own jar. But I don't feel that, right? But when I look at <laughs> the work I have to do, my property in Connecticut, property in Georgia, maintaining a home here, two kids in daycare, a, a, a wife who Amazons every week, that every day, that that ten percent, <laughs> you feel that when it goes. But I love God. And I worship him and he has blessed me over and over again. And I'm in covenant with him and he's sustaining me and keeping me. So yes, I feel it, but I'm going to give it as an act of worship. Amen. All right. Verse four. Um, but there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why wasn't this fragrant or why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. That's how you know this woman really sacrificed. Anytime uh, the trustee board said we could have used that to pay, to pay for something else, <laughs> then that person really sacrificed. And so look at this. They criticize her sharply. Imagine coming to worship Jesus with your sacrifice and somebody over here has something to say about it. What you purpose to give God is between you and God. I've been saying from the beginning, giving is not compulsory. What makes worship giving is that it's not compulsory. If someone makes you give at gunpoint, that's not worship. That's you trying to survive. <laughs> Maybe that's not the best example. Uh, but but we 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 when we give out of love and out of our free will, uh, free will is an essential element to worship. Uh, 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 however. Um, there are those who may criticize what you have to give. When you person in your heart to give to God, that's between you and God. Whether you tithe or not, please tithe. But again, that's between you and God. But know that it takes faith to tithe. And so you may tell someone uh, and being proud of that step. You know how you do something great? So you know what I, brother, sister, I tithe today. I tithe for the first time and I praise God. You know, I never tried this before, so I'm just trying to try God in a new way. And you might share this with someone with the expectation that they're going to support you, pat you on the back, say, go ahead, sister, go ahead, bruh, uh, and find out instead that they're casting doubt on what you desire to do for God, right? Why in the world are you doing that with all your bills, right? Why in the world are you trying to do this when uh, uh, I don't think this is a good idea? You know, you should just just give a nice offering and don't worry about it. You know, the, the, the church survived for 120 years without your tithe. They're going to make it another 120. You don't have to do that, right? And I would wager, I'm talking in here and I'm talking to Cyber Sanctuary and I'm talking to you who are watching this later, a good handful of you either were talked out of trying God or were almost talked out of trying God this month because when you shared your thoughts with others, they then like the people in the text, begin to criticize your intentions. I want you to catch this note. Keep your sacrifice to God between you and God. Keep your sacrifice to God between you and God. What you choose to give God is between you and God, and it's an act of worship. And what you purpose in your heart to give God 
uh, very often when you share with others, they, they may have something to say. Whenever you share something, you open yourself up to be criticized. So be aware that whatever you share, you open yourself up to be criticized and not everyone in the house of prayer. Everybody in here is in the house with Jesus, but not everybody in Jesus's house has a heart for Jesus. All right, let's go to verse six. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always and whenever you wish you may do for them. Do, you may do them good, but me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. And so what Jesus says is not that we should not help the poor. Helping the poor is always a good thing, but in this instance, it was not a God thing. You can commit to a good thing that's not a God thing. This woman had a revelation of Jesus that others did it. And so she anointed him for burial and preparation for the crucifixion. This was a God moved. This was a God ordained move. And so, yes, giving that money to charity would have been a good move, but it was not a God move. And so a good deed is not always a God deed. For example, there are people who say, I'm going to give my tithes to charity. That's nice to help charity. But God said, bring the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat, there may be provision, that there may be supplies in my house, all right? So catch that note. A good deed is not always a God deed, and good giving is not always God giving, all right? Are we still clear? All right. So let's wrap up the Gospel of Mark. Surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her and sure enough as we share tonight she's mentioned in all four gospels it's been over 2,000 years since this happened we're still talking about her tonight and and her giving she helped to further the gospel last note from mark give to promote the gospel of jesus christ give to promote the gospel of jesus christ all right when you catch that note join me in john chapter 12 we'll look at that and i just have one more note for you here and we want to look at the elements of uh, uh, worship and giving. John chapter 12, starting at verse 1. When you have it, say amen. All right, starting at verse 1, it reads, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead whom he had raised from the dead. There, there they made him a supper, and Martha served him. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed Jesus' feet, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This, he said, not because he cared about the poor, but he was a thief and he was the treasurer, oh Lord. And he used to take what was put in it. All right. So... Whereas Mark says there's a group criticizing the woman, John reveals that it is Judas specifically who takes issue with the woman pouring the oil on Jesus under the rules that he wants to take the money and give it to the poor, but really he wanted to take the money, period, stop sentence, right? Um, but what we need to do, ask, you know, even without knowing John's, uh, excuse me, uh, Judas's background, we need to ask, why would he question this? This is a man who's followed Jesus for three years, and he's seen Jesus perform all kinds of miracles and heard all of his teachings and uh, three times raised the dead back to life. Most recently, the same week, he raised Lazarus back from the dead. As awesome as he knows Jesus to be, why would he question a gift to Jesus, right? Um, and so I want to push that to you. Uh, for those of you who are trying to worship through giving 
if you find some criticism, you pray for the person's heart. Pray for the person's heart. I'm not calling them a Judas, but pray for their heart that they would be inspired to get to the point where they see the necessity of giving to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And then always question their motives and help them to see themselves. Catch this note. Always question the motivation of those who discourage you from giving to Jesus. Always question the motivation of those who discourage you from giving to Jesus. All right. So again, we see this woman represented in all four gospels and all those, there's some variation. We have this woman coming in and giving a tremendous sacrifice, but particularly as we see Luke's version, which is where we led, we see the woman coming in and uh, exhibiting faith, exhibiting love, exhibiting liturgy and exhibiting ritual. So as we worship through giving, how can we exhibit these as well? Well, let me tell you something. If you've given your tithe and this economic climate, th there's some faith there. There's some faith there. You believe God and you trust God. And there's levels to faith. You know, there's 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 the belief that there's someone somewhere out there, right? And then we're saved when we know that that is God who has given us, uh, who has made himself known through his son, Jesus Christ. And then there's trusting that God to be God in our everyday lives. And then there's trusting God with our finances, right? And so that's a, that's a level of, that's a mature level of faith uh, in order to trust God with our finances. Lord, you take this tithe, I trust you, and let it be used for the furtherance of your gospel. Then there's love. Uh, where, where we spend money, there's some love there. All right, where we invest. Uh, and so we love God. We have faith in him. We love him. We appreciate him. We're grateful to him. And out of that love, we are giving to God, right? But then there's liturgy. Now, this is what I want you to be prayerful about. When you give, uh, giving to God should not just be a check off the list. I've done it, right? Especially since we are not giving as a part of our Sunday morning liturgy as much. Some of you are still bringing your check. And so if you're bringing your envelope, filling it out, placing it in the offering, again, you don't have to have a ritual, but there needs to be an element of worship even in the presentation, right? So again, I go on realm, but when I go on realm, my deposit has hit and I say, Lord, I'm, I'm giving my tithe first. I'm trying not to get coffee. Man, those times, I've zipped and got some coffee and I realized I didn't get my tithe first. I'm upset with myself. And I say, okay, Lord, I'm trying to put you first. I didn't realize it. So I'm going to pause here. I'm going to bring my tithe, but pray about even your presentation. All right. Let that be an act of worship and how you give to God. Uh, and then sacrifice. We should feel it. When we give, we should feel it. We need to, we need to give in such a way that we miss what is giving. And that is what makes it a sacrifice. All right. So know that whenever we give, whenever we worship, that giving is an essential part of that. We are giving to God. And if it is not your your Sunday to tithe, you know, especially since we give electronically now, some of us are giving once a month and we're not putting in an envelope every Sunday. Make that once a month count. OK, this is my my coming in. This is my liturgy. Lord, I'm giving it to you. Flash your prayer before your computer or before your telephone or before your mobile device, before you give. Lord, this is my worship to you. This is my sacrifice to you. I love you and I want your house to be blessed. I want your word to go forth. I want people to be saved. I want people to be ministered to. I want people to be drawn closer to you. I want people around the world to know who you are. And I want people to be helped in their time of need. And so I pray that you receive as I hit this button to make my gift. I pray, Father, that you will have your way and receive my worship. Click. All right. Uh, worship is giving. Worship is giving. And giving is worship. Giving is worship. Amen. All right. Uh, any questions or thoughts? Any questions or thoughts? If you want to email them, uh, you can send it to uh, pastor at mtcbc.org. In the subject line, put Bible study, question or thought, and I'll respond to you uh, straight away. Um, 
Remember, again, that next week is Thanksgiving Eve, and so you have that time to be with your family. There will be a Thanksgiving Day worship service virtual, YouTube and Facebook at 11 a.m. And then the following Wednesday, we will have Workers' Council, but there will be uh, prayer and praise. Deacon Johnson, correct me, there's no prayer and praise next week, right? All right. Tune into prayer and praise to find out if there will be prayer and praise next week. Um, but we will resume Bible study uh, in Advent, uh, the first week of December. Amen. All right. Let us look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you and bless and praise your holy name. You're so good, merciful, and kind. We thank you for this time to study your word. And we thank you, Father, for this Try God Month. We pray for those who uh, who have been um, faithful and they are giving, and for those who are trying, stepping out on faith this month to try you in a new way with their tithe, we pray for those who may still be struggling, that you would continue to strive with them and breathe on them and work in and through them. And we pray for this house, that you would continue to bless us, that all needs will be met to abundance and overflow, that we might continue to share your great gospel and to be a blessing to this community and around the world. Now, as we prepare to go into prayer and praise, we pray that you would continue to abide with us, bless us and keep us and have your way. We will forever give your holy name the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.